Welcome to the award-winning Superhuman Academy podcast, where we interview extraordinary people to give you the skills and strategies to overcome the impossible. And now, here's your host, Jonathan Levy. Greetings, super friends, and welcome, welcome to a very, very special episode of the Superhuman Academy podcast, which is lovingly crafted thanks to this review here on my screen from Jen Segetti, five stars, titled Awesome. I'm loving the Superhuman Academy podcast. The host, Jonathan, jam-packs every episode with tons of awesome information, informative topics, and inspirational guests covering all things health and fitness. Highly recommended keep it coming. Well, thank you so much, Jen, for that. Unfortunately, we are not going to keep it coming because we are coming to an end at episode 300. And as you all probably know by now, we are putting together the 10 to 15 best possible episodes we can to let the show off with an absolute bang. And today is no exception. Today, guys and gals, I got the chance to interview a personal hero of mine, someone who I discovered probably half a decade ago, and whose work has dramatically impacted my life and the way that I live, my body, and the way that I feel. It's eliminated pain. I'm talking, of course, about Dr. Kelly Starrett. He is a doctor of physical therapy. He is a New York Times bestselling author of Becoming a Supple Leopard, as well as various other books, such as Ready to Run. He's widely known as one of the founding fathers of CrossFit, though I understand he's no longer affiliated with CrossFit. And he is known as one of the top movement, mobility, kinesiology, physical therapy, personal training experts on the planet. He trains police forces, special forces. He talks all over the country and world about these topics. And for good reason, because as you're going to see in this episode, Kel, as he told me to call him, knows more about the human body than probably anyone you will ever meet. He knows how to train it. He knows how to fix it. He knows how to teach you how to fix, maintain, and train it. And in this episode, we go wide. He did not disappoint. I've read a lot of his work. I've heard most of his interviews. And yet, even I learned something about how we can not only reevaluate the way that we treat our bodies, the way that we maintain our bodies, but what we can expect out of our bodies and how we can face even old age with strength, without pain, and with range of motion. I think this episode is really gonna change the way that you look at your body and look at aging. And I hope, my hope for you is that it is going to change the way that you act in your body, the way that you use your body He gives you a simple piece of homework here that takes 10 minutes a day. And I promise you, if you do it, your life will change. I really, really enjoyed this episode, as you can tell. And I know you are going to as well. So please enjoy Dr. Kelly Starrett. Kel, welcome to the show, my friend. I'm so happy to finally have you here. Super major pleasure, especially with what's going on right now. I know, right? Well, I figured you, you're not doing a lot of training, so I figured I'd reach out. You probably have some time for interviews. <laughs> but you know, it, it is, um, we are all, I think everyone's scrambling to say, what does, how do we coach kids? How do we coach adults? How do we, you know, I'm not an exerciser. We don't exercise people. You know, I think the internet has done a good job. Peloton has done that for us. But, you know, human movement is a little bit more sophisticated. We're supposed to be in coached environments. That's why we have Pilates and we have yoga and, you know, and, and Olympic lifting coaches. And so suddenly, you know, who are we? I think we're, we're riding on our, our sort of the skills we've taken into this, this crazy time. Well, and you're uniquely positioned because you have done the books and you have done the websites and the memberships and stuff like that. You're no stranger to online content. And we'll get in for the audience uh, in a little bit to kind of all the stuff that you've done. But do you think that, uh, do you think that this forever changes the way that people train? Well, I think it exposes um, and highlights our ability to be independent. So if you're, if you're a good coach, the goal was always to make yourself obsolete and you'll never become obsolete, right? Because, you know, it's only a fool who coaches himself. I think that's what they, uh, what my masters have always said. But I think it's interesting now is that we suddenly realized, you know, people were like, I don't know how to exercise my kids. 
Mm -hmm. I, you know, there was a lot of things we took for granted, I think around, I went, had a practice or I went and someone coached for me and, and you could be sort of mindless around it. I think there's a great Socrates quote that says, no person has the right to be an amateur when it comes to understanding how their body works and the glory of being yeah. a human being. Well, suddenly, you know, what we found and our finding is that, man, how robust were we? How independent were we? And so, um, you know, there's a kettlebell shortage in America. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, <laughs> which is really great, by the way, that people are actually investing. <laughs> in That's kettlebells. great. And, you know, we have been saying for over a decade, you know, you've got to have a home gym. You have to, and it doesn't have to be very complex, but you just need a couple things. And, and some of it is maintenance, right? You like, you know, even if you don't have a room for a barbell and you live in a city, if you have a kettlebell, you know, one or two kettlebells, <clears throat> you can take care of a lot of movement practice. And I think this is where we really need to start to split hairs to say, were you exercising? Or did you have a movement practice? Because I think what we're finding out is that many of us did not have movement practices. And that's what we're, we're realizing right now. And, as, and the whole thing has broken down. I mean, I appreciate this a black swan event, but you can't see your physio. You can't see your Cairo. You know, if you have persistent pain and chronic pain, how are you managing that? I, I just, it's highlighted some of the gaps in our understanding and sort of things we just took for granted. Totally, totally. And I do want to talk about the difference between a fitness practice and movement practice, a CrossFit practice. I want to backpedal a little bit though, because like I said, I'm a huge fan. I don't know that everyone in our audience knows about you. So I would love if you told me a bit about who you are and what you do in your own words. I tried to summarize it in the intro, but you do a lot of stuff, my friend. And also, I, I just want to know, how does one become one of the preeminent thought leaders on movement and mobility? Like, Ooh. how did you get into all of this? Well, I'll tell you, um, that's very nice of you. Uh, I'm a physical therapist and a coach mm -hmm. and the practice and the work I do somehow spans those two is I'm really the, the, the two of those things. It's like a big overlapping Venn diagram with a leopard in the middle. And um, <laughs> what I'll tell you is that I am always had an eye on performance. And what I realized early on is that I was obsessed with skiing faster, biking faster, kayaking better. I used to race on a national team, two national, two different kinds of national teams. And then I broke. And so the old model was outwork everyone, whoever did the most work wins. And that was my model until I had a neck injury that, you know, forever made my right, made my right hand numb at the time and weak and oh my changed my life. And when I asked around, it short, everyone was like, oh yeah, we knew that would happen. I was like, what do you mean you knew this would happen? You know, you knew my end would, my career would end. Well, and the old model was, let's go as hard as you can until you break. We'll back off and see if we get further next time. And honestly, this is, this is how we used to train our best athletes. And those people who were super robust didn't break as early, right? And, and were more tolerant. And we got a lot done on the glory and the capacities of being anti-fragile humans. We are so robust and resistant. But paddling three times a, you know, uh, you know, 300 days a year, sometimes twice a day, working in weight sessions and cardio sessions, it was just too much. And I had poor movement. I didn't recover. I didn't, didn't even think about tissue quality. We just went hard in the paint. So, you know, fast forward, well, all of a sudden I realized that I needed to go to physio school. I had a sort of moment of Satori and realizing that there was a, such a gap between when I was in physio school, the gap between you know, how we were training our athletes and what rehab was and realizing that there was some sort of connection there. So my first year of physio school, I discovered CrossFit um, in its early iteration. And really, for those of you who don't know, besides the baggage that comes along with CrossFit, all they <laughs> were saying now. is, Ooh, <laughs> all you need to say is, hey, were you competent with kettlebells and dumbbells? Can you do basic barbell lifts? Hey, are you, can, can you handle some basic gymnastics rings, some simple tumbling yeah. and then have a savage aerobic system across yeah. short domains and long domains. And I think what happened initially was that I, I was a really thought I was a really good athlete, but found out I had big gaps in my physiology I had big gaps in my understanding of skill and my understanding and technical training. And then what ended up happening, I think is we got a, we got a huge bump initially by, improving people's coordination, improving people's skill, and all of a sudden all aspects of their life improved, right? Well, that, I mean, that should, that mm -hmm. should make sense. But meanwhile, I'm a, I'm a, I think the end of my first year, early second year doc student, 
and I'm coaching big groups of people and I'm looking through the lens of sort of incomplete mechanics. And what we had said was, well, you know, you can't put your arm in your head. Let's just, you know, do more of that. And meanwhile, as a physio, I was like, well, let's mobilize for pain. And I realized suddenly that we could mobilize for position. And that was not a conversation that was happening. Yeah. We were not using strength and conditioning as a diagnostic tool. We were using strength and conditioning to, to buttress our physiologies. How strong are we at three reps? How strong are we at five reps? How strong are we at yeah. 10 reps, right? Or I look really good, right? I look good naked. That must be good enough. Or, right. hey, I, I handle these two-minute intervals or this 20-minute FTP, but we were not using this formal language of movement, which was exposing us to all the things and all the ranges that humans need to have. And suddenly when we made that the center of our understanding, because I could go from cause to effect, because I had a physio practice, I was a young physio, I'm watching people exercise, I'm like, there must be a connection. And the distance between the squat rack and the treatment table is like a million miles <laughs> with, a, with a thousand people in, in the middle, including a physician who didn't watch you squat. She didn't watch you run. She doesn't know anything right. about your lifestyle. What we've come to realize, you know, in the last few years, the physios are like biopsychosocial model, right? Like, you know, who you are in your society matters, you know, how your perception of you know, health matters, how your environment matters, it's not just mechanics. And I was like, well, you mean training? Because right. what happens is your range of motion, your capacity, your ability, your force production, your output, man, it's tightly coupled. If you show up today and you suck, I can ask you, well, what's going on? You're like, oh, I went drinking last night, right? Or, or hey, I, my volume is really high, or I'm really stressed at work, or I got into a fight with my wife. And all of a sudden, we have this really interesting diagnostic tool that also tells me about your incomplete range of motion. And the fact yeah. that, hey, you flew on a red eye and ran a whole marathon, and now you came back and you can't touch your toes, and you're super stiff, and you have knee pain. So what I've come to realize is that strength and conditioning is the best way to make the invisible visible. And that's what a movement practice does. It sets us up to understand what's going on in real time so that we can improve it, manage it, ameliorate it so that we don't have to wait till something breaks before we realize there's a problem. Right. I call your book the uh, owner's manual for the human body. When people oh. ask me, like, what's this book? And it's important, I think, to emphasize, I might be giving you too much credit or not enough credit because I don't know the history of your space. But I always say, you know, the foam roller or sometimes you see people with the voodoo bands or the peanut or the lacrosse ball. Nobody was doing any of that back when Kelly Starrett wrote about it. Not at the scale that people are doing it today. And I, and I, I like to say, you know, it's the mechanics manual, not just the owner's manual. It's the mechanics manual for how you use and maintain the human body. Uh, well, let me, let me say this, that for as long as there have been humans there have been people trying to prove the human condition. So yep. two and a half million years of evolution, we had shamans, we had Chinese mm -hmm. medicine practitioners, we had, we had Indian you know, not, you know, medicine practitioners, we had osteopaths from the early Britain. So for a long time, you know, we were in Korea and I found a, a pile of horns and, and bones on a table in this traditional part of Seoul. And those are scraping tools. Right. Yeah. People have been scraping and doing gua sha and cupping and heat and looking at yeah. diet and nutrition for as long as we have been humans. And if you actually go into some of the old pictures and old martial arts, you really see that they're instructive as much as they are aesthetic, right? That yes. they're talking about positions. And that's because honestly, for the last 10,000 years, certainly in our recent history, the shoulder is still the shoulder. It hasn't changed. You haven't changed much in 10,000 years. I'm a little fatter. Your femur's a little longer. But <laughs> structurally, we're really, really similar. I mean, our jaws have de-evolved. So that's one thing. But right. what you're seeing is that I think as long as there have been humans, we've been obsessed with this. But these things kind of got couched in and mysticism. Um, if you were lucky enough to have a master like Egoscu, you know, or, you know, you were working along Jean-Claude West or some of these early masters or Shuli Sarman was your teacher, like you killed it, right? But what we hadn't done was we hadn't said, this is in the, your domain. And suddenly we had the advent of the internet. When I started making videos on the internet it was 10 years ago in September. So in a couple of months, it's been 10 years since we started Congrats. the mobility project. Whoa. The iPhone didn't have a video camera. That's when we started this. YouTube was brand new. There was no Twitter. Honestly, there was no, there was no Instagram. 
You were um, submitting YouTube them was by smoke signal. <laughs> pretty much. And <laughs> what we realized suddenly is that we had access to not just our community. We weren't just working with runners. We were working with everyone. And what we got was these bigger data sets. We, were all, we knew all the runners. We knew all the cyclists. We knew all the Olympic winners. We knew all the gymnasts. We knew all the football players and basketball players and baseball players and hockey players. And what we, what the only skill, real skill set I have is I'm pretty decent at pattern recognition. And I saw all of the overlap and the positions of interference. So I could see suddenly and understand yoga in a really profound way and be like, wow, this is really powerful. I could jump into a Pilates class and be like, holy crap, Joseph Pilates figured some stuff out. But what we began to then ask is, well, how do we turn anything that you're doing into a diagnostic tool? And I think that's what's amazing. And what we've, what we realize is that, you know, for a long time, and it really got our country into trouble, we said pain is a medical problem. And and how did that go for us? Well, back pain is through the roof. Chronic pain is through the roof. Opiates are destroying families and cultures and communities. I mean, just the number of surgeries. How are we doing? And what I, what we saw was, hey, pain is a really complex. And as one of our friends from uh, Stop Chasing Pain says, pain is a request for change. And for us, it's just information like loss of range of motion, like loss mm -hmm. of force production, like inability to do something. It's just information. It really gets your attention. But when we began to ask the question, why don't you know how to soothe yourself, desensitize, decongest, improve or restore your native range of motion, not just flexible forever so you're Gumby. Like yeah. the, everyone agrees that there's a certain range of motion that we all should have. And when we made the book, what we really suggested was you should be able to perform basic maintenance on yourself. And that yes. is a danger, dangerous and radical idea. And that inspired the hell out of me. My original, so I, my main business is I teach memory and learning and the same idea of like, why don't you know how to operate your brain the way that most yes. people don't know how to operate their yes. body. And my first book was called Become a Super Learner. And it was inspired by this Becoming a Supple Leopard. Um, you know, I've heard you say, Kel, that I don't remember the exact quote, but you said, you know, if you're the average modern human or if you're a modern human, start from the assumption that you are compromised. And I love that because it's so true and most people don't realize. I think the average person, especially if they don't have pain, they walk through life thinking that they're just fine. And then one day they go to pick their kid up and their back goes out like that. Or one day, you know, that was they one to, heavy, one heavy kid, right? And then all of a sudden, like things start to fall apart and they realize, wait a minute, I don't have range of motion in my hips. Talk to me a little bit about the ways in which modern humans are compromised and, and how we differ from your paleolithic man or woman who use their body the way it was evolved to be used. Right. They died at age 25, but right. had killer <laughs> hamstring range. Killer um, hamstrings. I think the way to think about it is, is when we say compromise, what we're saying is that you are in a compensated state. That means your brain is the, I mean, and this is your business. Your brain is the most sophisticated structure in the known universe. Mm -hmm. It is so complex and so subtle and so incredible. And it's going to solve a problem for you so that you can do what? Move through the environment, feed yourself, reproduce. I mean, yes. those things. And if we look at the human body, what we were really supposed to do is get up and down off the ground, carry food back to, right? manipulate so we could feed ourselves and probably throw something really honestly. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what the physiology suggests and right. um, you know, walk around a lot, right? So move through the environment so that you could eat. So when you take this 30,000 foot view, cause I think the mistake is, and not that you made this, but that we sort of, we romanticize our, our prehistory. Right. And, and what we want to say instead is, well, what is it that we've always done for two and a half million years of evolution, and more importantly, the last 10,000 years. Well, we walked somewhere between eight and 14,000 steps a day on average. Yep. And it's interesting that what we see suddenly is a culture and a community that doesn't move enough. So at a cellular level, there's an idea called mechanotransduction, which means that you have to have mechanical input to your tissues for those tissues to express themselves. So turns out what gets stronger under load? Ligaments? cartilage, 
tendons, muscles, mm -hmm. bones, discs, all of them get stronger when you load them. And what we need to do is be under a kind of constant and persistent load. So suddenly what we see is that if you take a uh, orca out of its captive in, out of its nature natural environment put it in captivity the fin starts to fold over and this is an idea from katie bowman who is one of my my superhero friends and she says look that folded fin syndrome is because you're not loading that fin it's not swimming it's not hunting it's not fighting it's not being an orca and then you change its environmental demand so it spends a lot more time at the surface right. and the collagen at the base of the fin is subject to wolf's law and Wolf's Law, Wolf was like an 1800s physiologist from Germany who's like, oh, when you load bones, they get stronger. When you don't load bones, they, uh, they remodel and become weaker. Well, right. that's your body. And so what we haven't said to people is, hey, are you progressively loading? Do you remember the calcium osteoporosis like crisis of the late 80s, early 90s? Like yeah. there was a million- Eat your yogurt. Calcium chews, we threw <sighs> calcium at women. Oh, oh, it's calcium and magnesium. Well, it turns out it didn't change anything. Why? Because yep. we weren't also loading the bones. So then we're like, oh yeah, you gotta jump. And walking's not enough and you gotta carry stuff. And when the signaling of the bones goes out, then you can uptake that calcium. So first of all, we're not moving enough, which means that we start to fall into this sedentary behavior trap, which has a whole host of metabolic issues with it. And so you can basically define all behaviors as if I'm above one and a half METs or metabolic equivalents, I'm active. So if I'm, I'm right now perched up on a stool, I've got my feet on the ground, but it's like I'm drinking at a bar. I'm up at here at a bar height, but I'm above one and a half metabolic equivalents. If I sit down below, if I stand up completely one and a half. So do you remember the we, the, the, the play, uh, was it who, yeah. who made the we, right? Nintendo, so the we, yeah, yeah. Nintendo Wii, they found out that the Wii was burning as many calories as standing. But that was the magic. You got people playing off of their butts and standing and moving. And then that was why people were seeing these incredible benefits. So first of all, we're not moving enough. Second, let's talk about your sleep. So there's yes. always been a night day cycle. Um, according to our friend, Kirk Parsley, Doc Parsley, yeah. Last year, we used to sleep 6.2 hours. The year before, 6.4 hours. So he basically has a cutoff because he's worked with uh, elite Navy SEALs forever and ever. He's a, he's a Navy SEAL doc that anything under seven hours of sleep is a stressed state. So seven hours and below and you are surviving. That's like you're getting emergency rations and you're living in a lifeboat and you're like barely holding on. That's seven hours of sleep. Eight is our cutoff for humans clearing waste from the brain, right? right? From getting deep restorative sleep of putting out growth hormone and testosterone and, re and recovering. And what we're seeing is, man, this phone is super fun. And, you know, I have to battle my daughters. My daughters have to turn in their phones at night. You know, my little one has to turn in at 10. You know, my, my older one has to turn in at 11. They have to be in my room. Last night, my, girl, my oldest 15-year-old has a friend over. The phone doesn't end up in my room this morning. She loses her phone for 24 hours. Because for you. it's about protecting their sleep on these addictive technologies. So yes. notice I haven't even talked about how much you should deadlift or should you run. I was going to say, like, you haven't even mentioned the fact that people you know, have no hip range. And so what we, and what we've come to realize in this biopsychosocial model is that when we, we have to start to really put these environmental principles first. And part of the reason it's important to eat whole foods, like, right, and eat the vegetables and get as best quality protein that you can afford Right. All, you know, we, we, what, what did our friends, Rob Wolf and Dan Rogers say? They say more protein, better cow, which I love. Yep. Right. So, but in that idea is, man, we're not engaging in the eating principles of eating snout to tail of eating 40 kinds of vegetables and fruits in the day of, you know, getting all these essential fats, man, we are, we have been a, a soy corn forward diet for what 40 years and 50 years and how's it going for us we're we're falling on our faces so notice i should be in a tribe and feel safe right i should eat whole foods i should walk and sleep and then what was your next question because if you do those things you'll see that you're a lot more tolerant of the silly bullshit that's awesome i i fully expected you to talk about range of motion strength 
but it's so much more foundational than that, right? It's it, that's like well, just the tip I, of the iceberg. Yeah, and what ends up happening is we end up getting into the weeds about minutia, which technique, which tool gives you the fastest results. Da, da, da. And I'm like, how can we even talk about that when you are inflamed and the reason your knee hurts is because your brain has sensitized or as your body's become sensitized, your brain has perceived that 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 run is such a threat that you have knee pain all of a sudden and it turns out it's yeah. because you were super stressed and your dog died and you didn't sleep and so if i want to just you know throw a blanket over the big fire the first thing we need to talk about is the fact that you're probably going to be 100 years old so let's get those things on track first and by the way the things i just said are the same conversations we have with every elite Mm -hmm. sports group, military group, CEO group of all time. Why? Because that makes the basis for, for high function, high output. And the hidden story here, and something we try to talk about in all the books, is you actually don't know what you're capable of. You, you think you're killing it, but you're actually stuck in third gear. And you have a right. sixth gear, a seventh gear, an eighth gear. And you, you may never touch those until you begin to appreciate that, hey, that bottle of wine that you're using to take the edge off, which is reasonable because <laughs> you are a stressed, stressed human and this is the only tool you know how to self-soothe. That's costing you sleep. That's why you're fat. That's why you're insulin insensitive. That's why you're going to go on the, the diabetic medicine. And, and I want to just be super clear. If you don't think this is a problem, like we're going to be bankrupted. And when we all went to high school, chances of us being diabetic, one in 4,000. And now <laughs> it's one in four of our current kids, one in four, independent of where you live, how much money your parents make, how, what the color of your skin is, what your beliefs <sighs> are, one in four. If you're an African-American woman, it's two out of three. If you're a Hispanic Latinx male, it's two out of three. So how are we doing? How, we're killing it, right? Instagram's got all more abs and more tan and more body pumps and shred. And what oh, I'll man. tell you is that we, we are, if this is about using sport to understand the human condition, well, we're not doing that. We are engaged in circus and training is circus and fitness is circus. And let's stop playing at circus. Let's start upholding the promise of science, which is to improve the humanities. I love it. I love it. And I love the way you think. And one of the things that has, that was so eye-opening for me when I discovered your work is I used to think that, you know, you, and you do to some extent, specialize your body for different sports and that there yeah. was sacrifice and you're a big proponent of CrossFit. I'm a huge fan of CrossFit and a CrossFitter. Um, I'm but a I heard big you fan of cro CrossFit style training. That's true. CrossFit style training. Yeah. Let's, let's clarify, especially now, but I heard you tell a story once, which blew my mind just around what your body is capable of and the range of different movements that you can do if you are properly training it and maintaining it. And it was the story you told about a yoga teacher who kind of judged you sight unseen. Oh. Do you remember the story? I would love if you shared it. Well, I was on a vacation with my family in Australia and I jumped into, I'm going to, Jay, I'm going to go get in this yoga class. She's like, oh, she shakes her head and she's like, all right, good luck. And you're a big so guy. She, I'm, I am 235 pounds. I'm under 10% body fat. I can see my abs, but I've right. been training really hard for right. 15 years plus, right? Right. And um, I'm also 6'2", so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, but I'm thick. And I definitely look like a meathead. My wife calls it the meathead tax. I always pay a meathead tax. And <laughs> I show up to this class and I'm, I'm five minutes early and it's already there and it's already occupied by people who clearly do a lot of yoga and they're virtue signaling with all the right clothes and, you know, and this, they, everyone turns around when I show up and uh, they kind of shake their heads and kind of snort a little bit. And then the woman in a really condescending voice says, have you ever done yoga before? And I was like, mm, no, I haven't, but yes, I'll be fine, ma'am. And I was like, it's <laughs> on, you're fucking dead people. <laughs> and not that yoga is competitive, but in that moment, it certainly was. Needless to say, I probably had the best yoga session I ever had because I had intention. And at the end, yeah. you know, people were turning around. And at the end, the yoga, the teacher came to me and said, hey, clearly I misjudged you. I'm sorry. And I really appreciate that she owned up. But she said, I didn't realize you were a yogi. And I was like, oh, I don't do yoga. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, who has time for yoga? You know, and she's like, what? And she's like, what do you do? And I was like, I lift weights. Have a nice day. And, but yeah. key in there is, look, I was in the sauna this morning. I've already done my movement practice. I, I took my body through spin-up. I've done some breathing, right? 
And if you have a complete movement practice, it turns out yoga is a breath practice wrapped into a movement practice, which is, can be the same thing as going to the gym. It can be the same thing as handling a barbell or kettlebells. And if you understand that the yogis figured out positions and mechanics around, I mean, how much time do you spend rounding your back and straightening your back in yoga? Because they were like, mm, you should be able to flex your spine. Well, that's why we right. do kipping pull-ups and rolling and, and why the Jefferson curl matters and, and learning how to tumble and somersault. That's all the language of strength conditioning. And so when you start to connect the dots, then I really don't care what your style is because not everyone wants to lift heavy weights and suffer up the hill. And I get, don't get me wrong. I think you need to breathe hard and be under some load, right? There are some holes at yoga. If you just do yoga, you're not going to the Olympics and you're going to have some holes in your game. Right. If all you do is three lifts, powerlifting, you're probably going to have some holes in your game and, right. and not be very competent when we have to go on this hill or carry something. So, the idea here is I want people to be agnostic. We're agnostic about the way you train. In fact, I think you're smart enough to figure out what you like to do, which means suddenly then we can have the next conversation about, well, let me see if you're touching all of the positions and shapes that a human should be in. Then we can start to overlay some simple conditioning. Because if, you, if you're like, I love to swing a kettlebell, go to yoga and be on my Peloton and I go to church. I'm like, Ooh, you're, that's a pretty damn good practice. You belong, you breathe hard, you move well, and you're under yeah. some load. And then we can start to needle down on, Hey, where are the things that you could improve your fitness and your usefulness per right? Uh, uh, the move net crew, right? The, the, uh, Heber, who was the original French guy who said like, look, fitness is about being useful. What a great term that is not about, can I drop you on my bike ride, but can I, can I be of service? Right. Am, am I robust? And so suddenly when we do that, then everything is a beautiful diagnostic tool and everything helps us to understand what's happening in the system. Right. So I'm tempted to ask, and this may be, uh, a question that frustrates you, but summarize for me kind of your philosophy on mobility, because I, th I think I understand what it is. And I, I think it's much more than just mobility, right? But I'd love to hear you summarize it. You know, when someone says like, what's your philosophy on mobility? Well, you know, we are the people who popularize the word mobility. It was never right. used. Eric Kress right. used it in a video once but it was never used. And I chose that term on purpose because it didn't have the baggage with stretching or dynamic range of motion, flexibility. Right. Oh, right. And so I had a chance then to define it, right? Cause I yeah. say flexibility to describe the properties of a rubber hose. Like that's what flexibility is, right? If you, and I, I don't want to stretch you. I mean, you are an elastic springy person, your Achilles, your heel cords store 80% of the energy when you run correctly, naturally, and return 80% of that energy into your forward motion, 80%. So do I want to fantastic. stretch your heel cords out? No, I don't. I want you to be springier. And look, right. the Russians have even said for a long time, when you stop jumping, you start dying. Well, that seems really reasonable, right? Because yeah. you need to be springy. So this notion that we're just going to pull on something and something changes is really weird. And, and by the way, if we just look clinically, I have this belief that humans particularly athletes do what works and they don't do what doesn't work right are you with me totally. so if i say stretch you're like whatever coach i come pre-stretched i'll still keep. you know you, yeah. athletes don't do that there you have to hold right. their nose in it right and that's because they didn't see an experience and change in force production they didn't feel like they're injury proofed they didn't feel like they improved their capacity to hit a shape Right. So what we did was they were like, this may be not a good use of my time. That seems right. very reasonable to me. So comma, we enter the word mobility and suddenly I'm saying, Hey, here's what your native normative physiologic range of motion is based on every physician group, every physical therapy group, every chiropractic group. Everyone says, this is how much shoulder range of motion you should have period. Yep. Then I ask you, well, why can't you do that? And it turns out, 
that you can either do it or not do it. And it's predicated on a couple ideas. One, do you have the tissue range of motion to do it? Yes. And two, do you have the skill to do it? So it turns out movement is a skill and it's a practice skill. That's why children stand up and fall down like tens of thousands of times before they actually start to walk because it's practice, 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 practice. So what we can think then is saying, hey, is this, do I have a skill-based related problem or do I have just a tissue stiffness related problem? Yep. And then if it's just a stiffness related problem, I can easily apply any set of tools that fits into my personal schema or my cultural schema and that allows me to improve my position, right? Then you need to go practice that position in yoga, Pilates, kettlebells, barbells, yep. whatever it is you like to do. And then we're just arguing about tools. So when we divide the, the corrective exercise world, because if you go into the internet right now, there's a million corrective exercises and it's very confusing, <laughs> right? I don't even know when we work out anymore. We just do corrective exercises, prehab, right. corrective, activate. Well, my feeling is, all of those things are skill transfer exercises. They teach my body and my brain to varying degrees of efficacy, whether I can hit a position or not. Mobilizations, all the band distracted stuff that we invented, voodoo flossing, right? All the advanced techniques of soft tissue, all of those things, those are all what we call position transfer exercise. So I have skill transfer exercises, right. position transfer exercises. And the idea here is suddenly it's all good. What, what, you know, the, the art of coaching is figuring out which position transfer exercises and which skill transfer exercises you're going to use to do what? Keep an eye on your range of motion, maintain your range of motion, improve your range of motion, and more importantly, improve your output. Incredible. Incredible. And it's, I love that you differentiate for folks that it's so much more than can you get into the position? It's also, can you, can you function in that position? Can you be in that position under load? It, it's not just about stretching you like a rubber band. It, it really oh. is like, are you functional? Look, in the, I'm going to give all the dirty physical therapy secrets Please. away, right? There's only two things that we do in rehab. We either slow down, which is called tempo in training, right? Mm -hmm. I want you to do a four second lower. We, or we do isometrics. We pause. So I want you to stop there and resist. Well, it turns out your body does three things. It absorbs load, it stops, and it generates force, right? right. So those three things are called concentric, isometric, and eccentric. So I absorb load, eccentric, I stop. So are you capable across all those things? Because if you want a healthy tendon, it's got to be able to do all those things. So if your tendon rehab is only one thing, you're probably gonna have holes at either side. So a lot of the work we do turns out to be what we call end range isometric work, where we're taking you to the limits of your range of motion, seeing if we can capture your brain's attention to change your perception, to make sure you have control and quality there, right? And those are just end range isometrics. So if you do a lay on a roller and build tension in your quadriceps, that's just an end range isometric. I'm just putting tension yeah. into the system, asking you to meet that tension. So all of a sudden, it becomes a lot easier to understand what people are doing when we begin to appreciate that I'm either just really going slower, making sure that I'm exposing myself over those three domains, and right, right and, and then all of a sudden you're like, okay, I got it. It's really not that crazy. I love it. I want to touch on something you mentioned before, which is, you know, we're going to be probably most of us hopefully live to be a hundred. And uh, I've heard you say in the past, you know, our, our joints, our bodies are designed for millions upon millions of reps. The other day I was reading a, uh, a book on Taoism and this Taoist hmm. idea that you only have so much energy that you can expend and that, you know, you can overuse your body or your energy or your life force. And I was thinking to myself, knowing that this interview is coming up, I bet you Kel has a different perspective. I bet you Kel's perspective would be, you know, we touched on this a little bit, but you need to load a certain amount. So talk to me a bit about that, this idea. You know, I always think to myself, and I don't know if this is true, I, I'm relishing in the opportunity to ask you, but that biological systems are unique in that the more you use them properly, the better they actually get, unlike right. mechanical systems. Talk to me about that, because I think a lot of people will say, yeah, you know, I used to run a lot in my 20s, and now my knees are shot. Can't well, 
Oh, so th that Taoist approach was correct, but it was couched in spiritual terms and mystic terms. And the idea is we, they figured out if you work too hard and didn't sleep, if you yeah. only worked and didn't play, if you didn't downregulate, if you didn't meditate, you were going to suck, right. right? You were going to fool yourself into thinking that you could just outwork everyone. Right. And what's really interesting is I get these conversations, you know, this last year I've been at Google I have been at Microsoft, I've been Amazon, and people were like, so, you know, are we free of the human demand upon us because we are intellectual athletes, you know? And I'm like, no, like you, just because you work at a computer does not mean you get to skip the line of sleep, food, loading, nutrition, breathing, posture, whatever, right? right? And in fact, what I'll say is you think, your brain is so clever that if you think you are killing it and you're sleep deprived and stressed, you're sucking and your performance sucks and your output sucks, but your brain still thinks <laughs> you're killing it. What a great adaptation to have. So the Dow's right. figured out that it's not just about like a finite amount of chi that one day I'll run out, but that I have to replenish. I have yes. to, like the reason we exercise is not to get stronger. Exercise makes us weaker. Mm -hmm. Pause. Why? Because then we have this adaptation response, right? This is the notion of anti-fragility. Then I challenge the human structure. I challenge right. the biological system. And then it has an adaptation response. And that adaptation response makes me better. And you can look at that just like encoding memory, just like consolidating a learning skill. So I have to do a skill and then I got to pause in order for that skill to be consolidated in order for that behavior right. to be myelinated, right? There's a process that happens. That's why most learning happens and consolidation happens what? And when you right. sleep. So right. if you want to suck at learning a skill, don't sleep. If you want to suck at, at integrating a new movement skill, and by the way, your brain does not differentiate between cognitive behavior and physical behavior. It is the same. And we know right. that because mental rehearsal works at, physical skills and yeah. at emotional skills at, at, at cognitive skills. And so what ultimately what we have to do is challenge the appropriate amount. It may take us a minute to find what that amount is. That's okay. But to you, to the original question, we would much rather you be consistent before you're heroic because it is our human nature. I'm going to run. So today I'm running a marathon. Like, whoa, 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 whoa. How about you go walk for 20 minutes first? Right. And like, let's start going. And, you know, all of these cues, I really feel like are there for us. I mean, the old Russian model is like the repetition method, right? Where mm -hmm. you expose yourself to some of these loads consistently for a long time, their system becomes really robust, then you can move up. Like it doesn't have to be PR, PR. And the worst offenders right now are Strava. So anyone who's running or cycling on Strava, Strava rewards you for king of the mountain for new PR, for new output. And guess what? If you chase that every single day, you go to the well, well, the Taoists have something to say about that. And yeah. what we see is, man, we are seeing more middle-aged people blowing themselves up than ever before, which really starts to beget the next question. What are the best practices for me not to just make it to 100, yes. but to be able to get up off the ground and hike and have access to my range of motion capacities? There's no reason you should lose range of motion. You're probably going to get stiffer because your gonads are drying up as you become 70, right? Uh, uh, You're not uh, making uh. as much testosterone. And, but there's not a reason why you can't continue to be skilled or balanced. You know, there's an easy test that you can do. Just cross your legs. Right, cross it. your feet and oh, sit on the one, yeah. and then sit on the ground without using your hands. Yeah. Go ahead, I'll wait. All and right. then I'm at a standing desk. Ahead. I can do this. Go ahead, just cross your legs, sit all over the ground. I'm now, down. without without using your hands, stand up. Without touching your knee, now stand up. Oh, up. So it I turns out that's a bit in the socks, but <laughs> that's all right. That's hugely predictive of your ability to not fall to not die, to not have disease. Why? Love that. Because it's an issue of strength. We've taken your range of motion out of it. And suddenly, really, that's a low range of motion activity. And if you're having to put a point down, chances are you're more likely to have a fall when you're 70. And oh, man. I think the key here is that we do not play this long game. We play health and fitness like a game we're winning, right? 
like, what do we know about brain function, cognitive functions, you get older, you got to use it. You got to learn a new language. You got to learn a new skill. Yeah. Otherwise your brain's like, man, you know, throw on, throw on Hogan's heroes and mash and let's watch a rerun. And, right. and we know is that just like any biological system, it's use it or lose it. And the key here is it doesn't have to be use it like be a chess crane champion. It has to be use it like I need to go walk in a new environment. I need to read yep. and think. I need to argue and pay attention and play. Yep. And I think we've just lost our minds. We've just completely totally. lost our what's, what's important. And, you know, in the, in the search for abs, you know, we have lost the fact that, uh, you know, we should be playing more and feel better. Right. Our whole model of aging is broken both mentally and physically, my opinion, uh, because mentally we look at the first 20 years of our life as the learning period. And then we say, oh, well, I'm out of school. I'm not really learning anymore, which is wrong because you're learning more, especially today with the pace of change in technology, medicine, you're learning more, but also your body. We, we accept it as a given that, you know, like, oh, I can't, you know, I, I can't be squatting anymore. I'm 60. That's absolute horse. Yeah, isn't it amazing that Willie Nelson's still playing music? Right. right. I saw the other and, day a, a Chinese gymnast who must have been 65, I mean, doing a full gymnastics high bar routine. Incredible. With, yeah, you know, that, no... that, that's incredible. Um, what we're seeing on our performance side is that I have a lot of athletes in their 40s who are still really good. Yeah. And it actually has sort of blown up in the face of like Nike, for example. So Nike yeah. <laughs> had some really misogynist, you know, issues where if one of their athletes got pregnant, then they lost their contract, right? They weren't producing. Right. And they never had to do that because athletes would die or break before they were having kids. And suddenly we have people in their careers are so much longer. Why? Because we're getting better at this. And we're realizing yeah. that, you know, it, one of my, some of my NFL guys, you know, uh, when you're 40, you've seen so much football that you are a pattern recognition genius. You can identify shapes, patterns, like your brain has chunked information at such a prodigious rate for so long that no one can beat you. Physically, right. it's really tough to get run over by a you know, 300 pound you know, Wolverine. So you know, what's interesting is that we can actually extend the careers of our best tactical war fighters, our best athletes, our best, and we, we may have lost a generation of, of people's best performance just because we were playing this really short game of just like, yeah. let's use it, use it up and discard it. Like these guys were gladiators. And, and to your point, you know, how many musicians peak at age 22? <laughs> Not a lot. Not a lot. Not a lot. I've been super inspired by Zidrunis. Savikas, one of the world's strongest men, won in 2014. I had to just look it up because I knew he was above 35. He was 38 years old when he won the world's strongest men or the 2014 strongman. And the difference there, so people appreciate, is that the speed, if I had to look and make one difference, the speed is what was taken out. Our tissues right. become a little bit less speed tolerant. Yep. That speed, that acceleration is a squared factor. And it's the speed that starts to go a little right. cattywampus because our tissues, we aren't that as comfortable with rate development of force. But turns out you can still deadlift. In fact, the farmers used to call it the health lift. I just saw someone's <laughs> dad over 70 deadlift like 500 pounds. You know, Incredible. so, you know, the idea here is, man, these tissues, if we just slow down, and that's really sort of the, I think, the marker for me of, of strength training. We just take some of the speed out of it. We add a little bit more volume. You need to be a little bit warmer. But um, instead of push press, you get strict press. Instead of dynamic butterfly pull-ups, because your tissues may not be tolerant for that, then you get strict pull-ups, right? And so when we start to put the strict movements in, suddenly you're like, oh, and then you suddenly jump into Pilates and you're like, oh, it's even slower. And yoga is even slower than yeah. that. So yeah. it starts to make sense about what our strength practices look like. You know, what, at what point does your body stop healing itself? It doesn't. It doesn't ever stop healing. It doesn't stop remodeling ever. So is it harder to put muscle on when you're 50? Yes. But why did you wait till you were 50 to worry about your bone density? Because that age from, you know, from 40 to 50, those two decades are the most crucial decades. So my wife and I say now, you know, I'm, we're both 47. And we both say, hey, look, the game here 
is that we're training for the next 50 years, right? We're yeah. still going to throw down some performance, but you know, at age 50, so we're approximately, you know, I can't keep up with these young whippersnappers, but I don't have to, you know, right. I, I get to be in a, a, a senior master's group. And in the meantime, I can still whip up on some of these whippersnappers because I've been training for so long and I took care <laughs> of my body, comma, it's really about setting myself up and keeping muscle mass and bone density and movement quality yeah. so that I can then focus on, on, you know, continuing to play and being useful for as long as I can. Incredible. Now I know I want to talk before we get to the end of the interview about you've got some incredible diagnostic tools coming out to help people understand if I understand what, what you kind of give me a preview of understand where they need to work and focus. But I do want to ask, for your average person, because so many of us have very similar conditions. We spend so much mm. time in a chair. We don't sleep enough. We X, Y, and Z. What are the big things that you see that just about everybody should be doing? Whether it's uh, mobility movements, practices, lifts, what are the things that you can almost sight unseen and say, this is something. And the reason I ask is I love to give people actionable homework. I'm the learning yeah. guy. I know that if they don't do something from this episode, it's not going to be in the hands. It's not going to be in the head. The, the first thing I would honestly suggest is get a sleep tracker. If you're not using a sleep tracker, yes. and I don't think you need to be stuck with one your whole life, but if you don't really understand what the inputs and outputs are, yeah. you're missing a lot. And for example, in this COVID shelter in place, my wife who uses a whoop finally realized if she was going to get eight hours of sleep, she needed to be in bed for almost nine hours yep. because uh, uh, upwards of an hour of awake and toss and light sleep and you know and the disturbances yep, yep, is yep. typical and normal normal of human function so to get that eight hours you can't get in bed at 11 and wake up at seven that's nope. sub sub eight hours and um so w you know what we found was that and our friends at whoop um noticed and i'm not sponsored by them but i i think it's a really great tracker the the o-ring is great whatever you want to use amazon has a new track remind tracker. me That's to remind good. me to tell you about the one i've been using you're gonna love it <laughs> good <laughs> but the the idea here is um you start to see the inputs and the effects of your behavior and i think what's really important is i want people to appreciate that a lot of our behavior is tightly coupled yes. in ways that are hidden from us so if you have caffeine after between 12 o'clock and four o'clock, depending on if you're a fast caffeine metabolizer or mm -hmm. not, you will fall asleep, but you won't sleep as well. And so if you don't sleep as well, you're a little fatigued the next day and you're a little grumpy. And then at four o'clock, you're like, I need a little bump. So you have an espresso shot and then guess what, right? Then you're realizing you haven't moved because you didn't feel like it and you're a little bit groggy and tired. So you have an accumulated non-exercise activity and sleep pressure and you hit the brakes with some bourbon right? Or a glass right. of wine to downregulate. And lo and behold, your sleep is impacted again. So yep. now we're caught on this depressant sleep cycling and it's difficult for us to understand inputs and outputs because those things are hidden from us. Yep. And so one of the things that I would say everyone is, Hey, if, if you can afford a sleep tracker, get a sleep tracker yes. and just run it for a month, run an, uh, an experiment. My, one of my besties is a guy named Nick Gill and he is the strength coach for the all blacks. And the All Blacks are a rugby team in New Zealand. Pretty good rugby yep. team. And pretty good. <laughs> pretty good. And Nick is a savage athlete himself, but um, he has these ideas. He wrote a great book called Health Yourself for New Zealand because New Zealand is not doing great in terms of obesity and et cetera, et cetera, like every other uh, industrialized country. And he has this idea of just run an experiment. Just run an experiment on yourself. You know, that's like these diet resets. They're all just experiments. So I want you to experiment on your sleep. And without doing anything else, you're going to be skinnier. You'll have better skin. You'll be more cognitively clear without even having to go keto. You will PR on your 5K time and your deadlift. And I'm the best coach in the world. And I didn't have to do anything. <laughs> Secondarily, I want you to start a practice where you roll around on a ball or a roller Yes. 10 minutes in the evening. That's it. And, and you don't even have to know what to do, where it's what feels tight this. during the day, I what hurts, this. right? Yeah. And we call this the touch anywhere to begin model. And what I want you to realize is that if you put a ball or a roller or a wine ball or a rolling pin on anywhere in your body, it should feel good like a massage. And if it hurts, you have found a tissue that is what we call disnormal or is over tensioned, over tight, is sending air messages to your brain around threat. 
So if you roll around on your quadriceps, you one should be able to take a huge breath in and huge breath out. That's how we know you don't go too deep. And that's how we know that you own that position because you can take a full breath. So if I put my elbow on your, on your leg and you're like, ah, 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 you're just basically telling me you don't own that shape and you're sending a message to your brain that this is threat. I so you should be able to take a full breath. Also, you may think you're hurting yourself, but you are a badass human being. Yeah. And I guarantee you're not. But to make sure you don't overdo it because you're a meathead, make sure that if you can't take a full breath in, full breath out, you're working too deep. And that will help you modulate your pressure. Then I want you to stop. Take a big breath in if you find a painful spot. I want you to flex on that painful spot. So if you're on your quads, just flex into the roller, flex into the ball, flex into whatever it is for four seconds. So four second inhale, four second contract. And then I want you to exhale for eight seconds, which is yep. start to integrate down regulation and auto regulation through brain and through breathing. And you're telling your nervous system, it's all good here. And what you'll see is pretty soon you desensitize that tissue because your brain is not perceiving it as threat. You're moving lymph, you're, rest you're restoring sliding surfaces, you're resetting link tension relationships, you're improving blood flow. I don't care what the mechanism is. What I know is that your knee may stop hurting or you may run faster tomorrow, which is the thing I really care about. So again, 10 minutes, set a clock, pour yourself a cup of tea, right? Five minutes on the left side, five minutes on the right side. You don't have to do your whole body. Left leg, right leg, left calf, right calf, left tricep, right tricep. And realize, start a conversation. And what we've found is that if you have ever had a massage before, when you stand up from the massage, you went out and wanted to fight someone, right? No, you were all <laughs> chilled out and all blissed out and felt so good and your voice is super low. Well, if you do that self-massage, you will fall asleep and sleep better. And yeah. it turns out nothing good is happening to you in the last 10 minutes before you go to the bedroom. You are on Facebook or watching the news or, 100%. you know, on the, you're not doing anything. So that's the time to do it. I want to point something out. I'm, I'm going to make you blush a little bit here, Kel, but I want to point out to folks just the level of mastery and the difference between someone who knows a lot and someone who has decades and decades of experience, <laughs> because I can see the wheels turning in your mind and you're like, well, I could give them some like, you know, pigeon stretch or like things that every human probably needs to do, or, you know, some, some cat, cat camels. And, but you go immediately to what is going to be practical and useful and yeah. doable and attainable for everyone, which is 10 minutes, generic, I mean, massive impact. And it, there's not a single person here who has an excuse. The average American watches two and a half hours of TV a day. If 10 minutes of that is with a foam roller, you've already come out on top. There's literally not an excuse for not doing this. Yeah, my doctoral work was looking at adherence. What keeps people from doing what they say they're going to do, right? Because, I, you know, the adherence rates and all these things are, are terrible. You know, and terrible. It's because we're, you know, so a lot of what we've derived clinically over the last 15 years, but 10 years of this experiment we've been doing is asking people and watching people, how can we work this into your busy, crazy life? Because what I don't want to do is add another thing that you have to do, another checkbox. The thing that I would even do yeah. to take you a step further is put the roller next to the couch. Yes. So you don't even have to go and get it out of the garage. If it's right next to the couch, you're like, oh, it's right there. Make so I don't, even, I don't even sit on the couch. I sit on the floor in front of the TV when we're watching the news. Smart. And I'm like, oh, I'm already on the floor and there's the roller. And then the action to take that next step of, of doing some soft tissue work is so easy and really that 10 minutes is what we found look i'd love you to get told 15 minutes but 10 minutes i know you can do and that yeah. ends up being a functional chunk of time that we found we had much better adherence where people actually would do what we we're going to do and no one ever does 10 minutes they might do 11 minutes or 12 minutes or they get into it right but yeah if i say here's your 30 minute pre-bedtime routine, you're like, I don't have 30 minutes. I'm out. It's never going to happen. It never might happens. happen once and then you associate it with 30 minutes. And, and I'm going to do it. I promise you I'm going to do it because uh, after this whole COVID and not being able to do my full routine and doing a home workout and everything, I went back and immediately got injured on the stupidest thing. I did a pistol and just- Hang on, hang on. Sure. You, did not, you did not get injured. I so injured I be myself. Clear. No, 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 no. No, you- you are only injured if 
you have night sweats, dizziness, fever, vomiting, nausea. Those are signs of pathology. You okay. are injured if there's a bone sticking out of your leg or you twisted your okay. ankle, right? Which okay. you may have done. Or you couldn't occupy your role in society. Nope. Couldn't do your job. Couldn't play on your team. Everything else is what we call an incident. And it's normal to turn your ankle and to limp for a few days. You're not injured. If you go for a run, your knee hurts. You're not injured. If you tweak something, right. you're not injured. Right? It's really that. crucial yeah. to appreciate that because we use that language and it's not helpful language. So did you're you right. see a doc did you see a doctor for your ankle? I did not. It was actually my back of all things doing a pistol. Did you see a did you see a doctor for your back? No, nope. I did not because I so read you, becoming a sepal leopard. <laughs> well, and the key, the key here is that you realize that you're like, oh, okay, I'm having pain from my back around mechanics or something else. Yes. But in the bottom line is uh, that language is disenfranchisement. That language is I you're always right. need someone else to tell me. I mean, if you, if you need windshield wiper fluid in your car, you don't go to your mechanic. Right. Right. If, you know, and I think that's what I want people to appreciate. You know how to check the oil, you know how to like, you know, warm up the, whatever it is you do, we have those, those abilities. In us. So my point though, is you know what to do about it. And this is the game. That is the game. Yeah. I needed, I needed fascia work, you know, just get in there. And I had someone else help me. I'm going to admit I had someone else work on the fascia oh. for me. But you, would you think, do you think human beings didn't like rub each other and put their elbows in? 100%. I mean, read, go read the gates of fire right? Okay. About the battle of Thermopylae. That's Pressfield's book about the Spartans. And every Spartan warrior actually had someone who massaged and took care of the tissues. Really? And, oh yeah. Dude, come on. Amazing. People, I mean, you go to Thailand and Thai massage came out of working with the Thai fighters, right? The huh. Thais are the only, only group in Southeast Asia, who I think we've never been invaded. And Thai fighting came about culturally that like, and the That's massage so cool. came out of that. So when you're getting a 65 year old grandma destroying you and she's got her heel into your, your glutes, yeah. your adductors, understand the proud tradition of, Hey, yes. we have always needed someone else. And that's actually one of the things that's really sad about right now is that I feel like, you know, in a training group, our training group spots us, coaches us, tells us, keeps us motivated, but also helps us to be able to manage our little pain things. I love it. I love it. I want to talk about one more thing before we get into the app, which is something that I know is near and dear to your heart because you have a nonprofit doing this, which is standing desks. Uh, you got me on a standing desk years and years ago. And in fact, one of my first blog posts as a thought leader was I, uh, I came up with a design. Today, I've got something a little fancier. It's all bamboo and you know I've got my swiveling monitors. But back then, it was like an open source design that I put together for a standing love desk it. for anyone. Uh, so I'm going to ask a question that, that you've already sold me on, but for the benefit of the audience, what's the big deal about standing desks? Why found a nonprofit to put these in the hands of kids? Well, it's not about standing versus sitting. It's about moving versus not moving, right? Yes. And, and about having more a movement-rich environment where you can fidget. So a couple things. One is that if you stand still all day long, that's Tadasana and yoga, standing meditation, and it's also an error. But yes. what we want you to appreciate is that a couple things. One, it's not a standing station, I think, until you have a place to put your foot. So you need to have a foot up on something. Yep. There, there used to be these places called bars or pubs <laughs> where you don't drink alcohol. But they figured out that if you made the counter a little bit higher and you put a rail at the bottom, people stood and drank a lot longer because you could lean up right. against it, right? And putting the foot up took some of the extension load out of the spine and gave you a chance to fidget and move. So – the height of this station should be elbows to the ground mm -hmm. plus one inch. So if you bend your arms, elbows to the ground plus one inch, that's a basic workout. You might like a little yep. higher, a little lower. Yep. But you'll figure out your brain says this is the right height. Got to have a place to put your foot. And then I'm perching on a stool. So this yep. is a high stool, which allows me to do a whole bunch of very interesting things and change my postures during the day and be supported. And when I feel tired, I can lean but I'm still not sitting. So Love it. what we found is that people's work went up. They burned more calories at work. They stopped having fewer musculoskeletal symptoms that were consistent with not moving, right? Yep. My wife figured out that she burned an additional 100,000 calories a year by not sitting in a chair. 100,000 calories. You know how much ice cream that is for me? That's, That's so, so many much ice cream. It's so many Big Macs. And 
what we found again also is that you were, could accumulate enough fatigue. It's like walking. It's basically being loaded yeah. where you could then more likely to fall asleep. So when we start applying that to our children's school, our kids ended up at the first all standing school in the world, in the so world with cool. 500 kids at movement desks that were individually hided for them. So you and I aren't wearing the same size shoe. We shouldn't be at the same size furniture. Right. And now we have about 90,000, hundred thousand kids around the country at different schools, public schools in standing movement rich environments where they can sit on the ground, they can fidget, they can perch. God, and that would have helped me. <laughs> all of us. And the research around that is unequivocal. And what we're finding out, even through Texas A&M, the chief researcher there on uh, child physiology and sedentariness is Dr. Mark Benden. And he has found out is that most kids add two bodies, body mass index percentage points a year. So if your body mass is 14, oh, next year it'll be 16, right? And if you over course of two years, the kids who had choice, movement choice, ended up moving down two body mass index points. So that was a yep. delta of six to eight over the course of two years. So it turns out it's a, it's a magic bullet when it comes to right, ch fighting childhood obesity. And you don't need an administrator. You don't need a teacher. The kids like it. The teachers like it. I mean, they have to do more work because they get through their curriculum faster because kids learn better if that's important to you, if you want your kids to test more and spend less time with the principal, if those are important to you. But this fall, we are slated to do our first research if schools go back with the University of California, Berkeley. We have three Title I schools. Go Bears. Yeah, I know, Go Bears. We're, uh, we're, um, we actually are going to try to get this as part of our national conversation around, around movement. And it turns out most states have – activity minimum guidelines for their schools, but schools are not in compliance because they don't know how to administer the amount of movement, coaching, exercise, activity. They're out of compliance. And you know what we right. say is, hey, kids need an hour of moderate to physical activity a day. How's that going for us? Let yeah. me tell you, we're, we, are, we have the most fat, diabetic, out of shape, kids and it's not their fault and it's complex so let's go ahead yeah. and start to tug at the knot a little bit and just yeah. say hey if kids are wards of the state for seven or eight hours a day let's improve their health while we're at, we're at work japan yeah. just passed a law that the companies will have to look at the body mass index of their employees otherwise wow. they'll be penalized for higher medical rates that's incredible. And it's also, you know, I, I heard you talk about this uh, precedence of eight-year-old kids tearing their Achilles heel. Oh. Like, clearly, the, the hour or whatever of PE is not enough for these kids. And, and I've heard you talk about, I, I'm expecting a, a child right now, so I'm really excited about watching this happen. But hearing you talk about, you know, a baby can, can put its little, its big toe in its mouth. And that disappears as soon as kids start sitting in the classroom and and they're stationary all day so well, how about this we're like go outside play 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 you got to be active go play let's play ah, sit sit sit, <laughs> like, sit 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 sit, sit, hours, sit, sit. Hours. so you know I, the key here is that when we start to look again at those first principles we talked about are your children sleeping nine hours a night yes or no right are your kids moving enough during the day? Yes or no? Do your kids eat whole foods? That's co the culture appropriate whole foods. Yes or no? And suddenly it's a lot easier to make these decisions and we don't have to play a perfect game today. We'll play better tomorrow. We'll play better the tomorrow. After 100%. That. And 100%. that's, that's how the human being works. We we're the aggregated sort of experiences over long periods of time. 100%. That's our hypothesis. That's our hypothesis anyway. I want to give you a gear recommendation. You probably already know about And then I want to ask you about a gear recommendation. You know about this topo, ergonomic mat no yeah, of so, course oh, okay good 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 you're buying these uh desks by the tens of thousands which desk should people pick up in the audience if they don't yet have a standing desk uh you know the first thing i would say is um my favorite thing they do is uh vera desk makes a okay. vari is the new company uh it's it's a rebrand but they make a laptop tray i think it's called yep. the laptop 30 and it yep. fits on whatever you have already so you don't need to make a huge investment. In fact, just get some box. But what I love about the laptop tray is that I take the laptop tray and I go onto the ground. And then I work a little bit on the ground too. We're Squatting. supposed to, nope, sitting, kneeling, 
fidgeting, side saddle, 90-90. And what's an easy way to work on your hip range of motion is if you're sitting on the ground. It's one of the ways the body self-tunes itself is spending more time on the ground. And we don't spend time any time on the ground. So what's nice is that you can be like, hey, I'm just gonna check my email on the ground. And now I've just put in all this other movement richness. I'm sitting in end range. I'm long sitting. I don't have to do anything. It's like I've crossed that thing out. What I do for hip range of motion today? Well, I sat on the ground. Great. And oh, then man. when it's time to go and your kids, we want them to have those choices. So the, the laptop 30 is the best home workstation for kids. Barstool, laptop 30, you can get in the game for so, so cheap. I love it. And I love how talking to you, I can take a subject that I've known about for 10 years, like standing desks and the whole idea. And you can completely add a whole new element, which is like, it's not about the standing. It's about the dynamic motion and it's about the range of motion. And I love it. Well, I love uh, we it. are, we are practicing. I mean, we're, this is about us getting better. And if you, if I'm still yeah. saying the same thing and I haven't evolved to my position and then we'll come more nuanced and more practicable then shame on me. Cause you know, what we're seeing is, okay, we're running these experiments all the time. How do we get the next iteration? How yeah. do we make it more effective? How do we make it cheaper? And really that's, that's what I want people to appreciate is that, you know, we just have to begin somewhere. And if you want, I mean, a hundred thousand calories is a lot of beer. That's a lot of beer. All right, Kel, I have uh, very much abused your generosity of time here. I do want to bring us to a close. Tell us about this new app. I mean, you've, you've been doing online content since when you had to upload it by smoke signal. Uh, tell us about the new app that you're working on. When's it going to come out? I'll make sure this podcast comes out at the same time. And oh, then you're fantastic. working on a few new books as well. So tell me about that. Well, uh, the next iteration of the app, which we're really thrilled about, we should have a beta test in a couple of weeks and early August it'll come out. And we've got 16 self-assessments to help you understand the components of your movement quality. And then we have immediate programming to help you improve your ability to hit these shapes. So, you know, on our site, The Ready State, you have three choices currently. You can mobilize for pain. How do I manage this painful thing? Because that's our number one condition. Let's get you out of pain. Second is how do we improve your position? And third, how do we help you speed up your exercise adaptation? How do you help you manage your recovery so you get the most bang for the buck? And then what's nice is with this, there's, there's zero thing like this. This is the most comprehensive movement assessment that you can self-assess. And it's really, really simple. And uh, it will really help you keep an eye on it because your range of motion is sort of a dynamic, dynamic working target. And if we can get people comfortable with this quick self-assessment, then it's a set of tools. They'll be like, well, how am I feeling today? Let me check. Or I'm, these are the shapes. I'm putting my arms over my head. Well, that's a simple assessment. I do that when I swim and when I do downward dog and when Love I play it. on the monkey bars and when I'm playing volleyball. And suddenly you'll start to connect the dots. Um, the two big book projects we're working on well, three is that we've got another edition of Supple Leopard coming out in the nice. fall or the early winter, which I'm thrilled about. I'm getting that one in hardcover. Let me tell you. It'll be Snow Leopard and um, <laughs> all like silver. Apple, and, you know, go that's right. That's right. We're, uh, we're adding and it'll be, uh, we're probably adding another hundred pages to it. Um, yep. And then we've just finished a book on trying to reimagining flight travel right? Traveling by airplane. How do I come back intact? How do I protect myself? How do I reimagine so cool. the whole experience? And then we just started a project on what's it mean to be fit when you're 40 and 50? And how do you start to bank that experience for the next 50 years? That's really the goal. It's about so being cool. durable. You're actually making me question whether I want to put this podcast uh, to rest at 300 episodes because I'd love to do another episode about each one of those books. Uh, what's the name of the app? Do you know what the names of the books will be so we can put them in the show notes? Well, I think currently the book is Flight Plan and I don't have a, a title for the work. Maybe it's Durable or Future Proof. Um, Perfect. And then the app is just the Ready State app. So if you, the okay. Ready State right now, we've got a two-week trial. And I want people to understand if you never, you're interested in this, we've got a two week on ramp program that will help you learn the basics and you can cancel after two weeks, but still have a basic understanding yep. of how to take care of yourself. And that's really what we try to do with this two weeks is we have, we get a video a day, a little micro learning. You can just play around. You don't need a lot of equipment in the beginning. And you know, after two weeks you'll be like, Oh, I, I'm, I'm competent. I can speak Farsi. Right. I mean, that's really what we're trying to do. That is awesome. Kelly Starrett, Kel, 
This has been an absolute pleasure. I am, I want to thank you, but I want to ask you one more question before I let you go. I ask every guest, if people take away one big message, you know, talking about adherence, if people adhere to one big message from this entire episode and they carry that message with them for the rest of their 97 year old lives, what would you hope for that to be? Uh, that, um, your body is an anti-fragile thing to be abused and played with and enjoyed. And, um, you know, it's a lot easier than you think. Like you, you think you're working and you're at your limits and you are not, you, you can be more effective. You can have better relationships. You can feel better. You can have better look. And it's not that complicated. I love it. Kel, thank you so much. This has been a pleasure and an honor. Pleasure. Thanks, man. Thanks for tuning in to the award-winning Superhuman Academy podcast. For more great skills and strategies, or for links to any of the resources mentioned in this episode, visit superhuman.blog. While you're at it, please take a moment to share this episode with a friend and leave us a review on iTunes. We'll see you next week.